Hi, everyone. Uh, we are starting. So uh, I'm Eugene, and this is Harrison, and we are both from the RWKB team, uh, which is the first AI model to be under the Linux Foundation, Apache 2, uh, and its unique trick is that it's a linear transformer, meaning it's 10 to 100x lower inference cost, so it's a highly energy efficient and potentially infinite context time. So a lot of things that are very exciting for us to scale and potentially deploy it everywhere in the world, which Harrison will cover more. Yeah, so why linear transformers? So is attention all you need? A lot of people say yes, a lot of people, some people say no, and we're of the opinion that no, attention is not all you need. The problem is transformers have limits. As we know through the quadratic problem and the KV cache and all of that fun stuff, as you start generating more tokens, it takes more and more time. Cumulatively, it gets to a point where it's just not feasible to generate more tokens. And there's a lot of, a lot of hard work going into alleviating some of these problems, and, and ours is one of, the, um, one of the solutions. With linear transformers, we have a linear cost to both computation and memory size. And this lets us run incredibly fast on CPUs, GPUs, and a lot of, and possibly even FGPAs in the future. Rukov, because of this, is also one of the most greenest AI models, as its joules per token generated is one of the lowest. Um, we've had some some lovely people uh, benchmark some of this. I, as you can see there. Um, some of this is out of date simply because things move so fast. Rukov is comparable to transformer architectures of previous generations. Um, I say previous within the last two years. And our paper that was released, the paper that is released so far, um, it shows that it is comparable to the architectures of its time. How did Rukov achieve all of this? we broke the dependency in the LSTM token flow. All models take some representation of the, of the prompt, creates some sort of embedding space, and stacks some layers, and then produces some outputs. In LSTMs, you take some of the output and you put it through the input of each token and in a way that lets it learn, lets it keep in memory some information. However, this is very slow for both training and inference, as everything needs to rely on the previous token generated before it can go on to the next token. What we've done is we've actually removed that dependency there, and this allows us to do a lot more parallelizable training, um, and as you can see a bit later, uh, inference as well. So, So as you can see here, theoretically, we could do all of it at once. Did that perform well? No, not really. The LSTM falls apart when you don't have that, uh, that, that information flowing back and forth. So what we've done is we've replaced it with a, with a new, we'll say new, it's two years old, but uh, with a receptive weight key value system and we can see all the fancy math here, but basically we take some transformation of the, of, of the embeddings. We sum them over the entirety of the time there. While we're summing them, we also decay them by a certain amount. In the future, this will be data dependent, but um, our old versions simply just sum them and by a learned parameter, decay them over time. We've got a pretty standard channel mix block as well, um, which uh, FFN is usually how it's uh, how it's um, done. So I won't get into the nitty gritty of the math because that's obsolete at this point anyway, um, and we'll go into a bit of that later. So how it kind of works is we've got the token shift, the time mix, and that kind of gives us both a long-term and short-term memory. So the token shift here kind of forms a short-term memory graph. As you can see going from here, information is able to travel in a diagonal pattern, and this kind of forms a, a convolutional neural network, while long-term memory is able to go across here in the, in the time mix. What's the catch? 
we are only we're only trained on less than one trillion tokens. We we are currently in the midst of training more, and yeah. But even the old V4 pile model matches other transformers of similar size uh, in in scaling laws. Um, as they say, AI models want to work. What's stopping us? Well, GPU compute. Um, we're doing a lot of a lot of get putting together compute to to train more and larger models. Our open source project is supported by Eleuther AI and Stability AI. And where are we now? Because of course some of that is obsolete now. And what are we doing now? Well, we're still developing. Even now, look all of this. We're still developing more and more models that perform better and better than the previous generations. Also, we are work also because this is my favorite part is because of the lack of reliance on KV cache, we're able to do multi-processing and, and batch inference on a much larger scale completely naively. Other implementations for transformers involve, like include the um, VLLM project. And this is let, by doing multi-processing, it allows for utilizing the matrix multiplication optimizations in doing multiple requests simultaneously. So as you can see here, a single, on a 3090 at home, on a, on a 7B model, on a GeForce GTX 4090, a single person using it for a single agent or chatbot can get 25 tokens a second. But with 144 people connected simultaneously to the same machine, they all get 10 tokens a second, which on an absolute level gives a total of 1,750 tokens per second. They are, you might be thinking, why would we need so many, so many concurrent requests? Well, there's three things that I can think of that, that are useful. Scale for um, commercial, where you would be using the same model to serve many, many requests coming in. And on device at home, for example, uh, multi-agent games such as NPCs running them simultaneously as well as data set generation. So if you're doing synthetic data generation and you want to simultaneously generate a whole data set at once, then it is very useful for this. And we're currently in the middle of doing translations because with a single GPU, we can translate an entire data set over the course of a couple of hours. Yeah. So uh, what's exciting about the uh, the Roku ar architecture, and sometimes uh, we call it RWKV, they are interchangeable, uh, is, that, is that fundamentally what we want, what we're trying to build is an AI model that is on a completely different unit economics. We're talking about 10 to 100x cheaper than existing AI models. And that means we can run them at scale, be it on edge devices or on local devices. And, and, and we, want, we intend to further expand on this, on like building and training larger models uh, for more use cases as well. So how, how best to highlight this is actually like literally one of the demos that we had uh, is, is an AI town demo. Uh, and this is, it's a lot of echo. Uh, and this is, a, this is an, a, a, a mini game where you can have AI agents talking to one another and and you can literally have this entire town of uh, over 100 agents where they are just spending all day chatting with each other on this machine and it's still not saturating the system. In fact, uh, in fact uh, 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 because I didn't make this game, this game was originally like for a much smaller town. Uh, we only plugged it into our system and I worked with them. We scaled it up to the point where it broke pathfinding in the system. And the bottleneck is... Hello? Hello? All right. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Sorry about it. Yeah. Um, uh, wait. Hello. Okay. Yeah. Um, is this working now? Is this working now? Is this? Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So uh, we scaled it to the point where we broke pathfinding in the system, and the bottleneck was no longer AI, and, and that, that was here. Is that, uh, that's why you see all of them stuck. Is it cut off again? <laughs> yeah, so I'm just going to hold on to that as a backup. Hello, hello. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so 
Yeah, and it's kind of hilarious to, to just see it like chatting around like, um, let's just pick someone. Like, like I think this one. Oh, I don't know why it started in Korean, but it's okay. So, yeah, uh, yeah, you can see them just chatting with each other back and forth. And, and this is what we mean by running things at scale. It can unlock exciting possibilities of like uh, full game simulations where basically you have a living, breathing town. And, and this is just using a 3D model, which we can run on pretty much any modern hardware, respectively. So yeah, you can, you can find the links to the, de to the demos and, and that respectively. So, yeah. So if you want to give it a try, uh, you can find the links on... Sorry? Your microphone's working. Oh, okay. Hello, hello, okay, yeah. Uh, you, you can find the links at uh, at our wiki at rwikivi.com and you can give uh, our public demo a try to just chat with it. It's a 3B. Don't expect it to, to, to solve your meaning of life questions like open AI. Uh, but it's it can be a fun demo to play and it's something that we are trying to scale uh, higher uh, as, part of, uh, as part of being in the Linux Foundation as well. Because this model is completely open source, Apache 2. No funny licenses uh, and and we are working together with a few compute providers as well, uh, together with the Linux Foundation to actually help scale this bigger and larger and, and potentially even deploy in commercial use cases, be it enterprises, on-prem, and so on. Uh, for those who prefer to understand the architecture through code, you can actually also refer to Nano RWKB, which is a very small project. It's only around like 200 lines of codes, and it'll, it'll just go through the entire architecture. Otherwise, you can search for our paper at the wiki. Some quick links. Uh, okay. So yeah, um, uh, if you saw the original talk title, we actually put two talks back to back because we actually wanted to cover two topics. Uh, one is regarding RWKB architecture, uh, which Harrison covered, and the other half is actually the RWKB world tokenizer. The reason why I try to separate it out into two distinctive topics is that uh, part of the reason for RWKB success uh, is that is that uh, especially globally, uh, is not because of our architecture. Uh, and um, it's uh, having a cheaper inference architecture helped us grow rapidly in Asia and the, and the rest of the world because it allows people to run it on low-end hardware. And, but what was more important to them is that it supported their language. So currently, our, our user base, right, by rough number, because I don't have accurate number, is more like, 40% in China, 30% Japan, India, Southeast Asia, 20% in Europe, and actually the, the smaller group is in North and South America. Uh, 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 and that's mostly because like, there's a lot of English AI models that actually in this region, that, that more than satisfy their needs. And, and despite that, like I mentioned, like we, we grew well, especially in multi-language use cases. And, and this was because of a side effect of us being a very diverse user group. The, um, in the very same spirit as open source, right? Almost all the key contributors from, RW, from the RWKB group, right? Came from another country. Harris, uh, Harrison is from Australia. I'm from Singapore. Uh, if you search it up, uh, Blink DL, the original creator is from China. We have, uh, we have a few people from UK, Europe, uh, and various parts of Asia as well. Uh, and... And one of the things that came early when in RWKB v3 and subsequent v4 is that because we had a very diverse user group, is that and a very multilingual team, we wanted the AI models to support our language. And at that point in time, at the start of the year, uh, other than let's say OpenAI, uh, which did a decent well job supporting a lot of languages, in the open source space, you there was a lack of AI models that support European languages, let alone character languages. And, and because of that, we were very early pioneers in actually pushing this, uh, this frontier before joining the Linux Foundation. Uh, but in that process, we were forced to confront what I call the curse of using the English tokenizer that is holding back a lot of AI models today. So, uh, so what do I mean by that is that for our current generation of RWKV model, uh, we use a completely different tokenizer, which we call the world tokenizer. And yeah, and this allows us to actually push the model much further as well. 
uh, we also train it on multilingual data. So if you look at the RWKV V5.5b, well, we have very comparable results to the top 1.5b model, where we win some, we lose some, pretty much a tie depending on how you want to view it. Uh, we pretty much did a one up against all the model in multilingual tests. But in my opinion, this is not because of architecture. This is because we included the data sets to support those languages. We supported over 100 languages on our platform, uh, on, on, on our model, and that, that's just because we, 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 we did that as a, as a first in approach. So, um, why did we need a new tokenizer? Um, why did we make that change? Uh, this is back to the debt. The to a tokenizer at the end of the day is what decides when a text comes in and embedding comes out, right? And, but however, right, traditionally, we use a tokenizer to optimize the training and learning process. Uh, it was to make our AI models learn faster because a, a tokenizer by its very original nature was supposed to be, let's say, if you have the, if let's say, COMP, it, and then you have a UTR, let's say there are two tokens. It, because uh, the tokenizers are basically statistical model of how the text appear, they were supposed to help the AI models learn those relationship. That's what we did, that's why we did tokenizers. Uh, however, that was below 1 billion parameters. Now that we are in the era of like multi-billion parameters uh, models, if you realize, right, you can just take any AI model and completely mess up the tokenizer, like in this case, like I'm just doing one character per, per token, and the AI model still understands it. Or, and understands it enough to just refuse to talk to you. <laughs> and, and this is, uh, and the problem with this original tokenizer, right, is that it, uh, when we did that, when we originally did that in the past, uh, is that we, basically um, focused on English and we inherit the statistical model for English. So yeah, and, and, and in, in that way, right, you can just view it as like, num the one way to view how AI models work is that you can view all these numbers and pretty much you can kind of guess uh, like one, five, two, three is down, uh, no, no, let you down, yeah. If, uh, you, you can think of it as if you see this sequence of numbers, the AI model will try to output that number. That's how AI models work, and that's why we use tokenizers. And the, however, like, because it, AI models can already learn on an individual letter basis, even need be, or no matter how we mess up the tokenizer, it's still able to learn, right? These days, right, the, when we build the tokenizer, right, it is not about getting the models to learn those relationships anymore. It's arguably more about for efficiency reasons. A model with a fixed param and architecture right, has the same compute cost per token. So if you ask ChatGPT or any AI model to, to, to help you with a complex problem or, tell, or you ask it to give you a dead joke, it costs the data center the same amount of energy, pretty much. And, and ideally, you want to like, reduce the amount of tokens that is required for efficiency reasons. And once again, this is more significant actually for transformers because of the QKV. But yeah, I digress. Yeah. So uh, why not build a super large tokenizer then to support every language in the world or to support every possibility of text? Is that, is that if you do a super large tokenizer, uh, one of the problems that you will face is that, uh, is that each token may not appear often enough for the AI model to learn. And because of that, like we informally right now have a sweet spot between two to the power of fifteen to two to the power of sixteen for tokenizer. This number range was basically settled on based on research on smaller models. So I'll clarify that there's actually certainly more research that need to be done to to figure out what is the optimal point for tokenizers. And yeah, I give basically a short, a short crash course on tokenizer, and and but then it's like back to the main topic. It's like. What was the problem with it? Why did we need to change it? And why did we need to change it for our world model? And because today, everyone uses BPE uh, tokenizer, byte pair encoding, and this is for almost every existing model out there. You see, the problem with those, like what I covered briefly, is that 
fundamentally, it takes up lots of tokens. You've probably seen some of the memes, or some of the tweets, and some of the criticism. For character languages, we are talking about three to four tokens each per character. Uh, and for European and Nordic words, is we are talking about, about three tokens. For English word, for each, uh, it, uh, it's 1.5 around there. And, and that means, right, for an AI model based on English-based BPEE tokenizers, it takes two to four times more effort to infer and train in non-English languages. And some of it is literally really broken assumptions that we had. Like for example, spaces are hard-coded into the BPE tokenizer as one of the delimiter that it needs to look out for. And frankly, if you look through the list of languages, not every language uses spaces. Not every language uh, do left to right either. So there's a lot of assumptions that are broken in, 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 this, in this format. And even though like, I highlighted character languages, right, it's easy to sometimes get like, like, oh, it's Chinese symbols or Japanese symbols. Obviously, those are hard. But the problem, that is the extreme. Even in the middle, right, let's just say French. And French is spoken in Canada, and Canada is your neighbor. It's like deja vu, a very common phrase, if you plug it in, is eating every, or, uh, as many tokens as there are characters. So, yeah, um, the same thing happens to a lot of European languages, frankly. So, what did we do? Because we are a team that wanted AI models to support the world for the people in the world and everyone to use it in the world, that's why we call it the world model, uh, is we basically dropped it. The BPE and decided to keep it simple. Um, but we keep it simple just because, like as we covered, we no longer, AI models have grown to the point where it no longer needs a BPE tokenizer and we could just use any form of tokenizer as long as it helps improve efficiency. So, that brings us to the RWK World Tokenizer, which is basically 65,000 tokens. Uh, and if this is modeled after 100 plus languages in the world, including English, uh, including Chinese, Japanese, Korean, uh, so on. Uh, and this was mis mis mostly built using the text from all the various languages on Wikipedia. It is significantly easier to implement because one of the, I didn't go into too deeply, but uh, BPE requires a very complicated statistical modeling to actually do compute the output. Well, well the world tokenizer is just about just finding the, the longest match and then just matching it accordingly. And what this means is that we still have the same amount of like uh, performance for English approximately, 1.5, but we substantially lower the cost uh, for non-English language. So that's about 1.5 to 2.5 per character, language, uh, and so on. And this tokenizer is already available on our repo and pending a PR for Hugging Face Transformer, it's actually will be available for any AI model to use or train. The downside is you will need to train a new model from scratch, unfortunately. So as an AI model builder, should you be using our tokenizer? Frankly, I think you should be exploring it, especially if you're building it for multilingual or even code use cases, because we did some optimization for that as well. But less so if you want to do English-based uh, models, yeah. And is, is our tokenizer that we uh, brought out final. Um, it's ready to use. Uh, we'll probably create a new one, because uh, for some reason, I forgot Braille, and I received complaints about that. I'm so sorry. Uh, we might adjust the ratio to deprioritize English furthermore to support more languages. And like I mentioned, we, wanted to, we probably want to experiment with a larger range of token count and see whether that negatively affects the models. But I think more importantly is that uh, the reason why I wanted to, to talk about this was that I want all of us to really be having that conversation in AI and thinking about it or working on it about what it means to support and grow AI in the ecosystem all around us, especially beyond English and especially beyond Chinese. Because right now the status quo is English. Had, uh, there's a English heavy side of the world where there's the English-based tokenizer, 
China being the other obvious uh, growing superpower for AI models as well, has their own set of Chinese tokenizer. And then where's the rest of the world? We live in a very large world. Yeah. So I want us to actually be embracing that and have that conversation. Open for questions. Is there a context of a tokenizer for like audio and and and, uh, and video and and um, <clears throat> images? And if so, how would how would you how 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 would you this work? Oh, so um, the tokenizer I cover is purely for text. Correct. Uh, there is there is like models that converts uh, images and audio into token embeddings. Correct. And that is used to merge with other text models. Um, in that case, we'll, it, it, uh, we use those respective, I guess, uh, tokenizing embedding models. And it's not really uh, one to, uh, statistical mapping. Uh, so it's basically a mini AI model to generate an embedding rather than calling it a tokenizer. That's so, right. Okay. Yeah. All right. But it would have similar challenges that if it's only trained on like a US data set versus a Chinese data set, you yeah. could have problems, especially audio, right? Is that yeah. True? So there's. Um there's a there's an audio tokenizer available. I've forgotten the name of it off the top of my head, but it's only really good for speech. But if you wanted to do audio, then you end up having to do stuff like uh, converting it into um, into the the image and then doing like image conversion to to the tokenizer as well. Yeah, I mean for audio specifically, you you can even extend it to musical instruments. <laughs> So it's not it's longer just words. <laughs> yeah. uh, on the Rukov uh, model, I hope I'm saying that right. I saw some reports that it does it doesn't deal with long uh, long history, long context as efficiently as transform transformers. I'm not talking about efficiency in terms of yes, the quadratic. Uh, the, the quadratic cost of, uh, of attention for for normal transformers, but that it it wasn't as effective as using at using the context going farther back. It it, uh, it decayed too quickly. Can you comment on that? Yep, uh, we actually have a slide specifically for that. <laughs> so uh, you want to yeah. So with our V four model, which was um, which is currently the the most available and like the most visible of our models, um, it we found that it actually only had an effective context length of 800 tokens on the 14B model. And this is because the, okay, so for a bit of history, the effective context length that we're talking about here is the ability for it to understand exact tokens given a particular context length. So we, we evaluated this by having it repeat tokens exactly from randomized data. And we did these uh, architecture experiments on V4 and found that it had very low, uh, very low effective context length. Whereas with our new architectures, which we've, um, which we've created, has a lot better at the effective context length, uh, as you can see here. Yeah. So uh, we don't have, we didn't put in the, the three B models uh, effective context length here, but the three B uh, model context length is already able to support. 8K to 16K, uh, at approximately there at the effective context length. And that brings it into transformer range. And we expect that as we scale the model larger, you can find that this context length so where it's able to handle things perfectly in memory will scale as well, according to the model size. And it, it potentially could actually uh, directly compete with transformers in this range. The way I will view this like perfect memory context length, right, is view it as Worst case scenario, the sliding window where the model can remember, and anything beyond that is where it has Lucy memories, which is the problem that you cited. And however, as long as this window is as big as or matches transformers, that means within that size, we should expect equivalent results. 
Another thing to note is that we intentionally benchmark based on the worst case scenario of randomized data, mostly because AI models are extremely efficient at compressing data. So there are people who use V4 models and have, uh, have ran like 2K, 3K, or 4K context length, and it still works, mostly because like if you give it a question or, or you give it a piece of text that was in the training data, it could literally just compress that to a handful of tokens. And that happens a lot more often than we give it credit to. So the only way for us to reliably test memories was random data because it couldn't be predicted. Any other questions? <laughs> Hi, uh, I was just gonna ask, um, so I'm trying to understand how this works. So you've replaced the key value cache with a single vector that you're compress you're quantizing all the previous vectors into like one vector based on like a time scale. Yeah, Is so in our V4 model, it was a, it was, um, in the V4 model, it was two vectors. Um, we needed uh, two vectors and it was compressed on, on, a, on an addition and decay format. With V5, it's a matrix state value um, where we actually have uh, each, uh, each state of each layer is a, um, is a matrix state, so up to 64 times the embedding size. Um, and th this is what gives us the, the much bigger context length in the V5 and V6 going forward. Also take note that each layer has its own set of vectors and memory space, so, so that, that's part of the scaling as well, yeah. I think there's another question. So just going back to um, <clears throat> its memory, so you, you mentioned that it could theoretically be infinite memory, but is do you see like a trend where it's just like the, like it forgets mostly the, the oldest part of, like the farthest out part of the context window? Or or is it just like, like for some of the most recent models, it's like it forgets in the middle, right? Like some of the stuff from, you know, Claude or, or other models where they find like maybe a drop off in the middle and it remembers the beginning and the end. Do you see the same sort of pattern where there's a dip in the middle or does it kind of like lose information or memory farther out in the beginning parts of whatever's in your context window? Yeah, so for the, so the way we train it is that we try to make sure that it remembers everything within a specific target window. And then from then onwards, it'll trail off. Uh, and in that sense, right, uh, especially for the V5 onwards, where, where we try to uh, push into the direction where it's data dependent, the AI model will start to choose what to forget. So in the very same way, I, you can ask me the question is, do I remember what I ate for breakfast? And the answer might be no, because my model in my head choose to forget that by now. And that's how the AI model will, will decide uh, respectively. But it, at the same time, may choose to remember certain things. So uh, this part is still slightly more theoretical in nature. Uh, and one of the things that we are trying to train it uh, firmly on is to actually ensure that it remembers system prompts even in extreme uh, context window lengths, uh, way beyond uh, what, was it, what is its ideal range. And because the rationale is that we should train it to remember important things more importantly and discard things that it thinks is not important. And and that's the rough idea. Um, there is data dependent decay and in theory should work, but this requires more testing, yeah. Any more questions? Okay. Okay, then uh, thank you very much. And if anyone wants RWKB stickers, we actually do have them. <laughs> <laughs>